Hello, everyone. We are now in our final unit for humanities. And so we will have essentially three chapters, chapter 10, 11, and 12, just like we have before three chapters per unit. This should be about the time that you finish up. Either you're, you're starting this and you haven't quite taken the, the third exam that you're going to. Or you've already taken the third exam and now you can kind of go on. Please understand, remember, we don't have a final exam. So the fourth exam is just over chapters 10, 11, and 12. So that we can keep it all straight and you don't have to go back to chapter 1, study all the way through and re study the things that we were tested on. Instead, it is just going to cover. Essentially, the Catholic Reformation and all the way through the Romantic period, and that's what we'll we'll deal with. One thing you will probably notice, though. And I don't know if you've noticed it already through a lot of what we've done is that a lot of ages kind of react against the age prior. So, you know, we had the, the, the Greeks and the Romans kind of adopted a lot of their stuff, but changed it. And then as the Christian Christianity took over and the Holy Roman Catholic church kind of spread throughout Europe. It started having very specific rules and very specific dictates, and then people started rebelling against that, and then they started cracking down, and then people started rebelling against that, and then eventually we have the Protestant Reformation, where people start up with whole new ways of looking at Christianity and then immediately start fighting amongst each other, too. So that kind of back and forth and back and forth and back and forth tends to happen. And we know if you pay attention to politics, whether globally or domestically, you'll notice that there is, there's kind of a continuum. We go up and down and up and down. We go conservative, progressive, conservative, progressive. Although the vast majority of us are kind of in the middle. We're not extreme on either end, but we get pushed or we get pulled or we react in ways that make us move closer to one side or the other. And that's just the norm. So these are really, I mean, all of humanities and the discussion of the history part is kind of looking at those different kind of shifts and movements, but also how they affect art and music and literature and humanity, how they affect our lives in, on a daily basis. So it's something to consider as we go through. Now, this chapter, if I, if you, if I ask you, what does Baroque mean or what does it embody? There are two things I want you to think about. One is emotion. Emotion is absolutely, and especially shock, awe, um, fear, you know, big emotional upheaval, but we're talking about that kind of extremes of emotion. So a cathartic kind of thing. And then the other half of it is kind of, I don't know, fluffy. It's, it's very intricate and detailed and over the top ornate. And so, you know, when we look at art, especially, but when we look at architecture as well, you're going to see a lot of drama in what's going on, you know, a lot of emotional impact, but it's surrounded by a lot of fluff, a lot of this kind of, think of it like a doily. And I don't know if you guys have grandmas who decorated everything with doilies, you know, you always had the little like crochet doily under everything on a on a little table and then there would be other doilies and then they'd have lace curtains and everything was lacy and doily well that's that's also the baroque period so it's kind of creating this sort of ostentatiousness along with this emotionality and it's just broke it's just what it is and you're going to see some things that will probably be familiar but hopefully i'll find some references that make it so that the chapter makes more sense to you as we go through so um, okay, so we, we dealt with in the last era before we went to chapter nine and looked at expansion, you know, as far as exploration and exploitation of the rest of the world, Protestantism was taking hold very strongly, especially in the north. Now, I do want you to see this is um, a photo that's just taken and it's, it's after the Protestant Reformation. But I want you to see kind of where things are and what happened. So there are certainly places and the, you, all the yellow stuff right there is Roman Catholic. So the Holy Roman Catholic Church holds sway over all of Spain and Portugal over in that peninsula, all of Italy with tiny baby pockets more towards the north of other stuff, mostly Calvinist. The red is Calvinism. So Calvin actually was from Scotland. So 
there's this, you know, Scotland is almost entirely Calvinist. And there are still pockets of, of other kinds. And there are certainly the more north you go in Scotland, the more likely people are Catholic. Because they don't, first of all, they, they're, they're much more rural and they don't get those changes, but they are also more distant from London and from England. Now, Scotland at, today, in today's world, Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales and um, Cornwall, there are several different areas within the English island, you know, that, that whole area that are part of what they call the United Kingdom. Ireland, Northern Ireland was taken by force into the United Kingdom. So was Scotland. And so the, the rabble rousers, the Scottish who don't want to be part of it, still make up part of Scotland. And you'll notice that there is a very tight line right around Edinburgh in Scotland, well, just below it, where it's separating Scotland, which is almost entirely Calvinist, from England, which is almost entirely Anglican or Church of England. Why? Because the Scottish don't want to be British. And, and I, I'm about to go to Scotland, actually, and they, the one thing they say is don't talk about England. Because the Scot, I mean, even today, the Scottish Prime Minister would love to call a vote of Scotland to do a referendum to decide whether they want to remain part of the UK. Because they don't. And yet England's government and England's parliament has made, said essentially Scotland cannot make that vote. And so there's there's been wrangling, but Scotland never wanted to be part of, of the UK. They never wanted to be joined to England. And they fought really violent wars to try to prevent that. But they England kind of overpowered them. You'll notice though, see the the, the Muslim group, there's like the peachy color down at the bottom, the salmon. So it's down down really everything in Northern Africa is going to be part of the the Emirates of of the Islamic territories. Then you look over towards really towards Greece and you see where the Ottoman Empire is and then above that Hungary and Poland. It's a really good idea in some ways to to think about okay, where are we geographically? So if you're not good at geography or you never studied all of this, this would be a really good time to kind of brush up on a, a lot. We even have, for instance, if you look over, look above, so we have France, which is right underneath England, then next to it is going to be going to someday be Germany. But right now it's part of it's the Holy Roman Empire and the other part of it is the Spanish Netherlands, which makes today makes no sense. And yet the truth is, is all of these different, you know, if you talk to most Europeans, the vast majority of them know several languages. And that's because they are always coming into contact with other people with other languages. But the truth is, is even amongst these groups, you see how messy everything is. So France is predominantly Catholic, but you see all the little red dots. Well, those are just red dots of Calvinism. The Swiss Federation is more Calvinist. The Holy Roman Empire at this point is predominantly brown, which is Lutheran. But the, that part is really mostly Germany. And yet it spreads north. Eventually, though, I mean, at this point, this is this is really these are the big groups of people who are different faiths, different, including the different Protestantisms. Today, though, do you notice, do you see any Baptist listing? No, because because Baptist didn't really exist at this point. In fact, the word Baptist comes from Anabaptist, A-N-A -A Baptist, because it, it's saying essentially don't get baptized. But that's because you're not supposed to get baptized when you're a baby. You get baptized later when you're an, a young adult or an adult. They essentially said you're not supposed to get baptized when you're a baby because you're not old enough to really take all of that pressure on. So don't get baptized until you're 15 or, you know, some some churches today, they try to make sure you get baptized between 8 and 15. Some of them won't even let you get baptized until you're 15 or older. And yet we still have churches today where babies are 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 baptized or they're at least given some sort of christening that's typical so the truth is is what we have now this that you can go into one town and there can be 12 different churches all of them slightly different denominations this comes from the almost immediate breakup of protestantism so as soon as they protestantism formed it started separating into sects and i mean s e c t s okay so sects. So th those little sections started ang being angry at each other because they weren't 
interpreting the Bible in the same way or interpreting services in the same way or, you know, claiming that this was in the same way. So the rules were different and they broke up and broke up and broke up and broke up. And now we have, I mean, far more than four different types of Protestantism. We have 15 or so officially recognized types of Baptists, let alone all of the holiness and all of the 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 different kinds of Lutherans and Presbyterians and and Puritans and everything else that exists out in the world. So while but while it's all expanding and it's all breaking apart like this, it's also breaking apart Catholicism. So remember, Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church had a, a kind of moratorium on all of this. They were in charge of everything. Now suddenly they're losing tremendous tracts of land, tremendous power. People are taking um, Catholic churches and, and shredding them. They're burning them to the ground and rebuilding Protestant churches. They're having their arts stripped down. They're having their, their archbishops are being chased out because people don't wanna be Catholic in specific areas anymore. And so the laws are going against them, especially as you notice way up North. So the Southern parts, Spain and, and Portugal and Italy today are still predominantly Catholic. The more North you go, the less Catholic people become. Now the Catholic church though, is suddenly really scared. They say, okay, look, we've lost all these people. What do we do? And they decide they're gonna have their own reformation. Okay, we had the Protestant reformation. Well, let's have the Catholic reformation or the counter reformation. So it's almost like a counterclaim, you know, you get sued and so you counter sue them. Well, here we go. And what the Catholics did is they at first, and this is Pope Paul III, he says, okay, you know, their, their counter reformation wasn't really that. It was essentially a double down. We, you, we use that word today. So they didn't say, okay, well, we're going to reform in these ways, and this is how we're going to change. No, it was, uh, well, we're going to go back to the inquisitions of the medieval period, and we are going to demand that everybody do what we say. And we're going to hold inquisitions. There was a Roman inquisition that began first. Very rapidly, Spain, Spain followed with a Spanish inquisition. And you know that they're the most infamous one because they were the most violent. And they definitely you know, kept going for hundreds of years. Well, now they've started up again. We're gonna root out all of the heresy. We're gonna torture people if they won't, you know, so that they can tell us who else is going, is turning Protestant. We can draw Protestant leaders, find them and track them down and arrest them. And we're gonna torture them and see what we can do to, to, to destroy Protestantism. So it wasn't a, they weren't reforming themselves at all, okay? They, they mostly they just kind of said everything that Protestants are doing is all wrong and it's all heretical and they're all sinful and they're all going to hell. So that was their response. They also did a tremendous level of book burning. And, you know, we have right now, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, keeping books off shelves and libraries, even public libraries. Um, but the truth is most of us, especially in the United States, don't want that to happen. What tends to be taken out stuff that the majority um, no, the stuff that those in power don't want to be read. And so it's, you know, even if the majority, even if, the truth is with most of us, you know, if I see a movie that I think will be offensive, I don't watch it. I don't demand that everyone else not watch it too. And yet this was the tactic. Remember, the church had been in charge. And so they wanted to be in charge again. So they literally amassed thousands of books and it had book burnings all over Catholic territory as a statement, you know, don't do this, don't read this kind of stuff. This is smut or whatever, or this is heresy. Don't destroy your soul by reading things like this. And a lot of what was destroyed, what was it? Was it, you know, bad, really bad stuff? No, it was writings by Protestants and non-Catholics. So look at the list down at the bottom, Martin Luther, Henry VIII, who founded the Anglican Church, even for spurious reasons. John Calvin's writings. Machiavelli, because he was not writing about religion at all. The Quran, because of course, you can't have people reading Islamic texts. Decameron. Now, this is all, I mean, this is going to include the Divine Comedy. This is going to include the Canterbury Tales. This is going to include any secular literature that takes a not so um, positive spin on religion. And so that's what he did. And they burned and burned and burned books everywhere. 
the other reforms they did were essentially let's eradicate Protestantism from Italy entirely. So they made it illegal. They wanted to essentially create harsher penalties for clergy who are found to have done bad things like um, who they if they broke their vows of celibacy and they got a girl pregnant or something like that or were having had an open mistress which many popes in the past had had and they essentially said no we need to move all of this the other thing they did which is really interesting is they started the gregorian calendar so they moved the beginning of the year from april 1st to january 1st why because then it wouldn't follow the jewish calendar literally but this Gregorian calendar also had all of the saints' days written out. The reason we have Halloween, for instance, it's probably the most religious um, holiday in the world, and that we that, that regular people don't celebrate. It's actually a very Catholic holiday. It's All Saints' Eve because All Saints' Day is November first. All Saints' Eve is that scary time before this time with all the saints are being celebrated together. And so that became a time of just kind of like um, Fat Tuesday, like Mardi Gras. It's, it's a time of festivities and revelry and debauchery before Lent. Well, this is a time of all of that before All Saints Day. And so, but they, they started all of this. They also developed a really fascinating um, group called the Jesuits. And this was, they were, they were essentially soldiers for Christ. And they developed this through the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was pretty much, they were, they were the ones who, who laid out the laws. This is what we're doing to change. Of course, they didn't really change. They just kind of doubled down. But this is what we need to do. This is how we take action to stem the tide of Protestantism and get rid of these Protestant, you know, heathens and blah, blah, blah. So that was one of the big things. And part of it included the creation of the Jesuit order or the Society of Jesus, all the, also called the Soldiers for Christ. And it was founded by Francisco Loyola, Ignatius Loyola. I can't ever say his last name anyway. Why did I think he was Francisco? So yeah, Ignatius Loyola, who has a very interesting story in the chapter you do, should read. Um, and many people who came to the Jesuit order, it was it was considered to be like almost Franciscan in that it was absolutely rigid. People did not join unless they truly wanted to join. It was it they could be some other order, you know. We have Francis, Franciscan friars, for instance. Well, they Franciscans back in the time of Saint Francis really took it seriously you know that they were going to be celibate they were going to serve the poor they were going to treat everyone with kindness blah 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 blah. the jesuits were almost militantly devout so they were going if it, if it took starvation if it took death if it took self-sacrifice whatever it took to serve god they were going to do and that included absolute celibacy absolute you did not find a bunch of jesuits doing naughty things you know in the background behind closed doors they that you wouldn't be a jesuit if that's what you wanted to do they also became and this is where we, it really becomes key why i'm even mentioning these people is this group became the the first real organized missionaries remember we'd had priests who went with the spanish armada for instance well it's spanish conquistadors and tried to convert much of the native population of mexico but these people these Jesuit ministers became missionaries all around the world. So they weren't going to go and make trade and make a bunch of money. They had vows of, of poverty. They were going to convert the masses out there who had never heard of Christianity before. And so really, you know, even though they were, they claimed, okay, we're going to take care of Protestantism, their whole goal and the church's goal was never to go back into Protestant societies and turn them all back to Catholics. They, they just kind of gave up on them. Instead, they s shipped out to new places, Africa, um, India, the middle, the, the East and the Middle East, China, the Polynesian Islands, I mean, and the Pacific Islands, Hawaii, all of this different area, even to Japan. And their job was to go out and spread the word and convert people who had never heard of Catholicism to Catholicism. And it worked. I mean, the missionary system that many different kinds of churches use today 
is very much based on this idea. You know, you you take people who are extremely devout, who have the energy to go out to widely disparate places in sometimes very dangerous territory and go in with the, the whole point is to convert the masses to the Catholic faith. And many people, you know, it landed on camp cannibalistic islands. Many people were killed by native populations who were fearful of them or who resented their attempts to, you know, shift them over to Christianity. Then, you know, of course, Japan ended up closing its doors to the West entirely. And mainly because on the basis of, of religion, they did not want Japan to be converted to Christianity. But all of these attempts were, you know, they, they really felt that their whole goal in life and their their purpose was to go and spread Christianity throughout the world and get people to become more and more people to convert to Catholicism. So it's not like they went any of the reforms that they did won back the Catholics that they had lost. The If people became Protestant, they shifted to Protestantism. They did not at this time shift back to Catholicism. The Protestants stayed Protestant. And honestly, the church continued to lose Catholics to Protestantism, various forms. But they also began to win over many millions of people around the world by converting them to Catholicism. So, or at least to some degree, converting them to Catholicism. And so there, certainly this is the first time that that kind of, I mean, it really wasn't, they weren't conquistadors out there taking money. They were, their whole of goal was to convert people to Catholicism. Now, the other thing, of course, here, here's a better listing of the reforms. They weren't really reforms. So what they did is essentially, I said, they doubled down. So they said the Pope is the supreme voice of God. In other words, no king could be the, the head of the church like the King of England, Henry VIII. No other person could be the voice, only the Pope. So any other, you know, Martin Luther, or any of these, John Calvin, any of these other people were false prophets because they could not be the voice of God, only the Pope was. So that's one her heresy. All those other ones are her heretical. They said, no, you have to do all seven sacraments. So all those things that Martin Luther had tried to erase, they said, no, no, you have to do all of them or you will never get to heaven. They also reiterated that the priests had to be celibate and unmarried. So they had to be virginal and not married to anybody. They, they need to wear very specific robes. They could not walk around in other kinds of robes. Nuh -uh. They had to be wearing Catholic robes. And then the music, remember Martin Luther had really said, well, let's have the congregation sing. And so they they he'd actually written a bunch of hymns based that were the music behind them was actually popular tunes so that people knew the, the music already and they could just sing the words you know so he reiterated a lot of psalms and then some other biblical verses and stuff like that into songs based on popular tunes it's why we have like um what child is this the christmas song is actually based on green sleeves which is was a, a just a folk song at the time with a very different message. And he they just transposed the, the holier words on top of the tune. And that, that actually happened a lot. What the Catholics did is say, no, all of that is heresy. You cannot bring a vernacular languages. So you can't bring German and English and French into the church. And they should not be sung by the congregation. If they're singing in other languages, they're wrong. That's all heresy. And it also shouldn't be using any popular tunes. Don't use stuff from the secular world inside the church. That's an abomination. And so essentially everything they did was just, no, no, we're right. And they're all wrong with one exception. And that was mysticism. They said essentially, okay, yes, you can have an individual mystical connection with God yourself, personal, on a personal level, but only if you were devoutly Catholic and ordained. In other words, you have to be clergy. You had to be a priest, a monk, a friar, a nun, somebody who was an ordained Catholic, part of the ordained Catholic ministry. A regular person, a lay person, some dude who owned a, a store downtown, you could not have this relationship with God. Only by converting to Catholicism and then becoming a nun or a priest could you do this. 
but they had examples, thank goodness. So, and they did, and they really made a lot of Teresa de Avila. And, and she, that just means Teresa from Avila, Spain. And she started having these visions that she was supposed to build churches, build Catholic churches. And so she did. She actually built more churches than any person in history that we know of. Um, but she didn't build them herself, of course, you know, but she had them built. And she, her writings ended up being spread all throughout Catholicism and, and, you know, to show, see, this is the kind of relationship you can have with God on a mystical level if you are an ordained minister. And so she, her, that miss, those mystical stories really caught the imagination of a lot of Catholics. But they were intended, of course, to encourage Catholics to join the ministry and to become either Jesuits or, you know, go be missionary somewhere or become nuns, priests, friars, you know, part of the regular religious community. But it essentially said that ordinary people, no, don't get that. So you can say, oh, I'm reading the Bible for myself because it's in German now, but that doesn't count. And you're not actually part of it. You, the only way you can have that connection to God is if you're a minister. So they, again, doubled down on their idea. And so that from that point on, they said, okay, so let's let's go back into the active mode. And so they published a lot of St. Teresa's um, memoirs and dream recountings and things like that. And they definitely pushed her story everywhere. Plus any, you know, they, they made it clear that any, any minister, any priest, any friar could have this kind of relationship too. So that attracted people to the individuals, to the, 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 the ordained ministers so that they could get, you know, a little sampling of that. They also re-upped the, you know, remember all of their art in the North, or at least most of their art had been destroyed because so many of the Protestant factions were iconoclastic. They absolutely resisted and rejected any idea of art inside the church, especially depictions of God, Mary, Jesus, or the prophets. And so most of the Catholic churches, again, had been covered with illustrations inside, you know, all sorts of frescoes and, and depictions and paintings and altarpieces and statues. And the Protestant church said, no, no, none of that is okay. And so they cleaned the churches out and tore all the art down. Well, Catholics said, no, 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 we need the art. In fact, let's go overboard on it. And that's where so much of what we're gonna end up talking about comes from. The vast majority of the Baroque period's art came from Catholic leanings. So much of what's going to, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be far more lavish. It's going to be, it's not gonna be, you know, have the same realism that the, um, Renaissance had. Instead, they're going to use what they call mannerist style. And it's intentionally not following Greek precepts and proportions. It's intentionally out of proportion and odd. And it's that the reason it is, is because it's in, it wants to draw your interest and get you to feel a little off kilter. The, the, the meaning and the feeling that, you know, even discomfort is the intent. So, it, for instance, in this particular, and, and I could open up seven, chapter seven, and show you Raphael's two Madonnas if you want. But they're just, you know, the, the Raphael's two Madonnas are very realistic. They're both out in a field in a rural setting. The babies, you know, John the Baptist and, and Jesus look like babies. Uh, everybody looks very normal. This is the new Mannerist painting. This example right here is, it, it's called Madonna of the Long Neck of all titles. And yet it's not her neck that's really the issue, it's her proportion. So let's just look a little bit. If you look right at her waist, for instance, which is, you can see, actually see her belly button through her, her cloth, but right at her waist, which is a, about three or four inches above the belly button, she's, we're almost halfway down the painting. And yet her upper body is very small, much smaller than, and her neck seems a little out of balance with the, how small her, sh how narrow her shoulders are and everything. But then look at her legs, her bum, just her, where she's sitting and the amount of, of acreage that is covering all of that is so massive. It's like she has a, a you know, a, a 17 inch waist and then her hips are 58 inches around. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's intentionally 
distorted. The baby, look at the baby. This is baby Jesus. Okay, first of all, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but, you know, I, he makes me uncomfortable. I mean, he's very bald. And yet, how long is this baby? I mean, I had a baby and my baby, I could literally hold in the crook of my arm. And yet this baby, there's no way. He's got to be at least three feet long. That's, I mean, most babies are, you know, like, I don't know, somewhere between 18 and 22 inches or so long. He's got to be three, three and a half feet long. He's gigantic and long and pale and he looks creepy. But it's intentional. Okay, I know that you're thinking, what? Well, all of these lines, it's the, the lines that matter. And it's, they want it distorted. Even the, the actual function of the, the, the landscape behind him. Okay, you see this gigantic pillar, or actually it's a row of pillars that, that are kind of barely off in the distance. But, you know, they're down a little bit of a level. But then you see a man in front of the pillars. He doesn't seem that far away. And yet he's tiny. So how far away is he? It's, it's all un- inconsistent. And, and so the, the, instead of creating a space that looks as realistic as possible, this seems to be creating a space that is just weird. And so this lack, I mean, even the fact the baby looks like he's about to slide off his mom's lap, which is not, that's even uncomfortable. I get uncomfortable as a former, you know, I used to have babies. Well, of course they're all grown. But this makes me uncomfortable. Like if I saw this somewhere, I'd be like go, running over and trying to help her keep the baby, you know, like sitting up because the baby looks like he's going to roll right off. But all of these, this is all meant to create drama. Even her fingers are so long and thin. It's a little disturbing. My fingers are like little pudgy things compared to that. But it's meant to be distorted. Her neck is supposed to be that long. Her shoulders are supposed to be that narrow. Everything is intentional, even though it makes no... The Greeks would have had a field day with this. They would have hated it. Um, let, me, let me look... And this is another, this is another painting by Parmigianino. This is an Italian painter. But he is absolutely painting in that dramatic, weird, mannerist style. So he did Madonna the long neck. But then this is the conversion of Paul. Now, Paul was Saul of Tarsus. He actually persecuted um, Christians. He was a Pharisee until he was blinded on the road to Ephesus. And then he got his sight back and converted to Christianity. Well, this is his, that moment when he goes blind, I guess, and falls from his horse or whatever. If you just look at the horse itself and you you've seen a horse before, you probably will notice that the horse is completely out of proportion. First of all, its head is way too small compared to the rest of him. And he fits, the way he's stopping, the way he's, you know, everything, he's he's a really tiny horse too. And yet he's got, you know, kind of, you know, bigger bum and his, but then even the fact that what's on his back is, is that fur? Or is that the horse with weird spots on him? You know, is that a blanket? You know, what, what exactly did he fall off of? And there's much more detail. There's much more painstaking detail made, you know, to make his, his reins, for instance, all curly instead of what they'd normally really look like. You know, it's all romanticized if you think about it that way. And then there's sun, sunshine way, way back in the back. But there are all these deep shadows and dark crevices. And then we get to Paul. And Paul is looking off into somewhere. We don't know where it is. And yet his hand is kind of the bigger, I mean, it's all supposedly foreshort, you know, the, that, you know, we do foreshortening where if something's pointed towards us, the, the arm gets shorter. And yet it doesn't make any sense. The, the, his back arm is actually connected to his, his neck more than to an actual shoulder. So his whole arm has been overly shortened and then his hand is gigantic and with really long tapering fingers too but it's all meant to be is it supposed to be in proportion for the 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 um for those who who did this kind of style no it was not proportion didn't matter what mattered was the drama of it so it was supposed to be 
you know, dramatic. He had just fallen off his horse and he was in so much emotional whatever going on. So that's that's so much of what the Manners paintings were doing. Now let's look at another example. And I can bring up, let me go ahead and bring up the the Last Supper, because I think it's important. And I just want to show you this. I didn't intend to, but I'm going to. Okay, so let's look at the Last Supper from the Italian Renaissance, and we're just going to scan back and forth between the two, okay? I just want you to see, there's the Last Supper. Okay, remember, this is where we were using single point perspective. The, the lines all merge right above Jesus' head. Um, and there were brighter colors, but this is, you know, Jesus and all of the apostles, and they're all very... You know, it's a very symmetrical painting, which, of course, the Renaissance people loved symmetry and it had a very regular balance. And it was it was, you know, even though there's a lot of unrest, it's a very it's a still a very calming painting. And Jesus, for instance, his face is impassive. It's very calm. Now, if we go back to this one, this is Tintoretto, of course, and this is Baroque. And so instead of I'm just going to go bigger. And we'll scroll over here so you can see it just about as big as the other one. This is the same thing. This is the Last Supper. And you can see Jesus. He's over here almost sitting. He's barely, I mean, he's almost sitting on the table, it looks like. Hunched over. He does have the little, you know, halo around his face. And then he's brightened up. Everything else in here is so dark compared to it. Everything is in shadow like this, like this, you know, he's the only candle in except for the the, the flaming brazier up on, on the, from the ceiling in the entire place. And the table is not straight in front of us. It's diagonal. Why? To make it more um, imbalanced so that it feels more tense. Jesus is not calm and impassive. He looks troubled. Everybody around him isn't looking at us. So they're creating, it's still creating a scene and it certainly has some type of dimension. And yet all of the lines are off kilter and they're intentionally so. He also, Tintoretto also made, actually painted up above in the flames and stuff, ghosts to make it even creepier. Why? Because that's the whole point. Why, why have a, you know, a painting if it's not, emotional and creepy and disturbing and it throws everybody off kilter the whole design is you know it's supposed to be dramatic so that it gets us to a pay attention and b to have some emotional investment in it that's baroque so that's part of it now we also get probably the most famous baroque painter and that is el greco he's he's not that's not his actual name uh, but his, his it, 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 he just called himself the greek even though he wasn't actually Greek, he was Spanish. <laughs> um, but he painted, in fact, if you go to the Prado in, in Madrid, in the center of Spain, in their, their capital, the Prado Art Museum is filled with El Greco. There are whole rooms just for El Greco. Now, El Greco, of course, was very Catholic, very devoutly Catholic, and he painted a lot of stuff along Catholic lines. So he painted a lot of things for inner areas of churches in Spain. However, a lot of what he did, of course, followed that mannerist style. So the bottom half of this painting, and I'll, I'll make this a little bigger too, just so you can see it. And you're like, if I don't care about art, boy, this is gonna be boring. Well, you know, the, the bottom half of the painting though is actually a person who was, who became a saint but he's being buried with all pomp and circumstance. You can see all of the, the richness of the robes of the people, the priests who are serving over him and, and burying him, but this is a funeral. And so everybody in the background too, they're all wearing very similar outfits with very dark clothing, very pale faces to create that contrast. They even all have the white ruffs around their necks, you know, that adds to the contrast. And then halfway up the painting, it, changes and that change becomes almost dreamlike if you look at the top half of this painting that's the style of half of el greco's paintings you look at the bottom half that's the style of the other half 
very gaunt, pale figures, very dark contrast between, you know, very, very dark black to very, very pale white. And a lot of weird stuff in between. A lot of his dreamlike sequences literally, you, I mean, you could again see a little bit of Salvador Dali in them. But the backgrounds, you know, people are are surrounded by what look like just rolls of fabric, just tossing around in the sky. And so there's no real ground or, you know, plants or anything that sets us in a particular space. Instead, everything is just swirly. And, and that's intentional. So who's up, up top? Well, that's Mary. She's, she's right there. And then we have, um, it looks like John the Baptist because he's wearing um, animal skins. And then Jesus up way up top. But all of this, and then they have angels up there and they have other souls. And, and so they're talking essentially, there's a suggestion in this painting that of course this saint is his soul's going up to heaven. So yay. Okay, so, but all of this is, it is dined to give an emotional impact. And this goes back to that idea that if you walked into a space, and this was from way back early in the medieval era, you walk into a space, they wanted you to feel awe. They wanted you to feel such a level of emotion that you really, you could almost not speak. And so what was gonna be captured in El Greco's painting? The emotion on people's faces, the angst, the, the fear, the, the fatigue, the tragedy of everything. And then on, in, besides that, everything was going to be very weird and mystical with all these floating sort of you know, fabrics. If you look up El Greco, I swear, do a good Google search and look up El Greco besides the stuff that we have in the, in the chapter. And you're gonna go, what? I mean, there, some of the stuff he has of, I mean, all different religious events is just odd. And yet it is absolutely the, you know, the mannerist Baroque style. So but with all that mysticism thrown in. Now, at the same time, remember Spain and Portugal had been, had been predominantly Muslim. Well, they were completely taken out over by Catholicism. Uh, the, the king of, of Spain had typically, you know, before this time period, had become, had typically been Christian. And yet for a long time, and that's one reason why Spain and Portugal remain somewhat Muslim, is, you know, they just kind of lived next to each other fine. They were just all right. You be Muslim, you be Jewish, you be, you know, who cares? It was probably one of the, the freer places to live in Europe during that Holy Roman Catholic Church. And yet at this point, this is 1492, this is the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, if you want to go back to chapter nine, and the king of Spain declares that Muslims need to not just, like there's no, not even, okay, convert. No, get out. Just get out. And the truth is, is the reason they had not been that way before is because when it was completely under Muslim rule, Muslims allowed Christians to live there and didn't give them a whole lot of hassle or Jews for that matter. And when it switched over for a while, they were pretty okay. They were like, yeah, whatever, Muslims just go ahead and stay. Cause they'd been there for, of course, generations and you know, thousands of years, hundreds of years. Well, obviously it couldn't be thousands. But then following the Italian inquisition by the Pope, you know, reasserting itself came the Spanish inquisition. In some ways, you know, uh, uh, through a cooperation of the King of Spain, who was very Catholic, and the Pope, who abetted all of this. And so they established probably the most rigid and, and um, scary uh, Catholic institution for the next oh, century or so, um, which would, yes, capture the Muslims and Jews or heretical Christians that it found inside Spain. And, and they would either be required to convert or tortured to, to until they did convert or tortured to death or sent out in exile. But no longer was it okay for you to live in Spain and Portugal and be Muslim or Jewish or Protestant. And then the Spanish court remained that way. 
and the Catholic Church in return established this this you know reiterated the divine right of kings that a king is born into his role and he has the right to lead and to be placed above all of the people under him and so the Catholic Church had already done that for a long time anyway in throughout Europe and that's one reason why so many rulers had supported it but now it was it, it reiterated it. yes you actually do need to be you know you need to support your king because it's the divine thing to do. You're actually supposed to by by Christian law. And then if Protestants, Jews, Muslims were caught, they would be executed. And there were it was violent. So don't don't let me I'm not gonna whitewash it at all. It was they would be either tortured to death or just outright executed if found. Because they did not, the, Spain was was determined never to be a Protestant country. At the same time, or meanwhile, in England, the opposite was kind of happening, which is just so weird. And yet it'll eventually come back sort of full circle. Richard the First, who, not Richard the First, no, Charles the First, who was son of James the First, who had been James the Sixth of Scotland, had once Elizabeth died and didn't have any kids, James came from Scotland and became King of England. So after James, you know, he, he had a son, Charles, and Charles, after James died, Charles I became king. Well, he was Catholic. Already a problem because, remember, the church had been, they'd gone through this whole Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant thing for a while, and they were tired of it. They weren't doing it anymore. And the vast majority of the population who, who served in parliament by this time was either Anglican or Puritan, which is even more rigid. And they were going to have none of the Catholic stuff. We we're all done with Catholicism. They didn't like the way he was ruling. And then essentially under the auspices or under the leadership of Oliver and Thomas Cromwell, one of whom became the, the one who ruled, the other one became like the main general who battled other forces, you know, who tried to get back the kingship or whatever. They captured Charles I, took him in custody and executed him. They beheaded their own king. And they began what they called now either the, the English Commonwealth or the Puritan Commonwealth. I was commonly taught it, it to be the, the Puritan Commonwealth. And because the Puritans dominated the, the um, parliament and parliament was in charge. There was no king. And so parliament instituted a bunch of rules. They closed all the bars, not a very good thing to do. Closed all the theaters, also not a very popular move. But they were, again, they were going to rule the country based on Puritan ideology. So it was going to turn into a theocracy. Maybe that's why they called it the Puritan Commonwealth. Well, that lasted for mm, 11, 11 years. And then um, people said, no, we don't want this anymore. And we're not going to take it. It, it. Honestly, Oliver Cromwell died. And it took less than two years after that for the rest of the parliament and a bunch of other people to say, nope, we're done. And kick a bunch of the parliamentary members who were Puritan out oust Thomas Cromwell as well and dissolve the, the existing par parliament as it stood and then invite Charles II, Charles I's son, who had been Prince Charles, who had fled to Scotland so he wouldn't be executed. They invited him back. In fact, they invited him back. It's such a wonderful, you know, he was just so secure in who he was and what he was doing that supposedly, at least the myth says, that he floated back to London on the Thames River in a golden barge. And that pretty much states Charles II to a T. Charles II became one of the most, I mean, he was—he loved spending money, let's put it that way. But he was really by that point, he, even though he was allowed to come back, Charles II was much more of a figurehead than an actual ruler. So he did not have the power that the Phillips in Spain, for instance, had several of the different Phillips in a row, or that the Louis will have in France. He he didn't have that much. In fact, J John, Richard the Lionhearted's younger brother, John, when King John was king, he had to sign the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, that essentially took much of the king's powers and gave those powers to Parliament. 
and that was pretty much the standard. Today, king the king and queen well the queen and then the king now is king, you know what king charles the third um he has almost no power he doesn't he he doesn't really rule england he's just the king of england he is however still the head of the anglican church so that's something to think about anyway that ended much to the happiness of a lot of people theaters reopened bars reopened people could wear whatever they wanted they didn't have to wear puritan garb um, so their strictures were, were dis and, and in fact, at that point, that's when they said, okay, look, we got to get out of here. And the Puritans did, they moved and they went to Massachusetts and founded a colony. And Massachusetts for a long time was one of the most religiously strict um, colonies in, of, among all 13 of them. So, but that's just because it was filled with Puritans. Anyway. Then we'll switch, let's switch to, so we had one king in Spain who abolished any other faith but Catholicism and said, get, get out or suffer the consequences. The Pope in Italy had done pretty much the same thing. There was no king of Italy at this point. So Italy does not become a unified country until the mid 19th century. So don't worry about them. Okay. Um, so, but the Pope was, was held sway in Italy. In Spain, it was this king, you know, the, well, the, the Phillips, all the different Phillips of Spain. Then we have, of course, Charles II takes over finally after the Puritan Commonwealth in England. And he becomes kind of this big lavish king. Well, no one did it as well as Louis XIV of, of France. No one. He called himself, and he, he did, he called himself the Sun King. He loved ballet, so he started his own government-sponsored ballet troupe which he danced with several times. Um, he was supposed to be, he was supposed to have lovely legs and be a really good dancer. Of course, no one would say otherwise for fear of, you know, incurring the wrath of the king because he could do and say anything he wanted. He really did rule, he ruled and he had unlimited power and money and he could do pretty much whatever he wanted and he did. And this would continue. Louis the Fifteenth would do the same thing, and Louis the Sixteenth would, for his very short life, do the same thing until we get to the French Revolution. And there are already going to be kind of underpinnings here. Louis the Fourteenth knew how to spend money, and he didn't really care where the money was coming from, but he knew what he what was important. And he did. I mean, there were good things about what he did. He certainly kept a lot of builders happy by creating a palace at Versailles. And today that that palace is actually um, owned by the government and and run as a museum, but it's I, I strongly urge if you ever go to France to go and spend, the, you know, go spend the ticket to get inside because a it's really fancy and b it helps them keep it fancy because in, in some ways knowing what people used to live like, especially kings is a is a bit it's well it's fascinating anyway at this time, though. Versailles was packed with people. It wasn't a museum and it wasn't barely being, you know, keeping its doors open. All of the money of the, the from the royal coffers were going towards building humongous, almost dormitories for the, the courtiers and the gentry to live in so that they could reside at Versailles. Plus, he had extra housing for all of the symphony because he started the, the his own symphony. It was one of the first sponsored, just like it was one of the first sponsored royal ballets. Well, they, he had the one of the first sponsored royal symphonies. He also sponsored many different um, tutors and academics and um, singers and performers and um, thespians. So you know, had, uh, lots of theater. He he start he definitely you know helped further the the. Op the development of opera because he found all of it to be important to him. So those different institutions, especially if you could be one of the lucky people to play in the symphony or dance in the ballet, you ended up getting room and board plus a salary, plus you got to perform all the time for the king, but all of that costs a lot of money. So he was housing and feeding, we're talking thousands of people on a daily basis. And it became really, really expensive. The other thing it did is it kept him out of Paris. And so he was not the, the he, he wasn't seen much by the, the common people. Um, mo many of the upper class stayed in Versailles with him 
And so they weren't so much in contact with the lower classes. And this would create much more of a gap as we go through between the very, very wealthy people and all of the poor people underneath. It's going to get to the point right before the beginning of the French Revolution that the common people are starving. And they're starving for a very important reason. And it's one that is absolutely begun by Louis. And that's that they're being overtaxed to pay for all of this. Because royals don't pay taxes. Nobility didn't pay taxes in France. None. They, they, they were not taxed, even though they had most of the wealth. And the church was not taxed. And so that left the third estate. The first estate was the church. The second estate was royals and nobles. And the third estate were all the common people. The common people were typically paying four-fifths of their salary in taxes. So think about it. I'm going to explain that to you more later, but it will eventually create havoc. And this would end up um, sparking the beginning of the French Revolution. So, but that will be later. That's a couple of kings later. Okay. The other thing that the remember, I they they wanted everything lavish. They wanted it to be really fancy, and so the the already they had designed Saint Peter's Basilica. This was designed, you know, partly by Brunelleschi, partly by um, Michelangelo, and yet most of those they'd only begun building by the time both of those two architects were dead and so what they did is they just kept on building and outside of the the basilica you can see the basilica from pretty much anywhere in rome this is in vatican city today and yet the then this is what the piazza looks like but this piazza was designed by another architect from the baroque period named bernini and bernini is probably my favorite um, sculptor of any of the ones we're going to study and i'll show you why you'll see in a minute if you haven't read it already then you've read it and you've seen the pictures and you go wow he is great but he was not only a sculptor he was also an architect and he designed this piazza today this piazza is typically filled with like on i think it's on thursdays the pope comes out to his balcony and if you're facing this piazza if you're you go down just a couple of floors there's a big balcony and the pope comes out on the balcony looks over this entire square and gives his speech every Thursday morning, I think, or Thursday afternoon. But they set the chairs out the day before. So we actually saw when we when I was here, we saw the chairs all set up and they, they set up thousands of chairs for people to sit and listen to the Pope speak every single week today. The other thing he does, and you could probably see this or find videos of it, he speaks on Easter morning even today. And there are a lot of people who are not Catholic who will check it out Easter morning and watch the Pope give it his yearly speech for Easter. And so it's one of the most watched programs on Easter morning around the world. But this was designed so that it could house literally thousands of people. In fact, they've had as many as they counted as many as 300,000 people here at a given time. Now, there are little statues. They're actually not that little. They're, they're a little bigger than human size, but you can see the statues up at the top, rooftop here, but there are statues all along the roof line, all the way around the piazza. So those aren't just little like markers. Those are people, like full size or slightly bigger statues of saints that are part of the Catholic church. And there are a total of 140 statues. Just to give you an idea, the, the pillars behind all of this back where on each of these circular sides are two, there are two on each, you know, there, there's one on each side. So you can actually walk through here, even if it's pouring rain, it's a big breezeway. You can walk between the pillars around to the other side, but those pillars are gigantic. I mean, the, the ceilings of those right there are probably 30 feet high my guess i mean I, I couldn't measure it but then it also has an egyptian obelisk in the middle and this was taken from rome that, that brought to rome in 37 bc and yet it is now the center of the piazza of the holy roman catholic church so they're they're essentially taking a lot of different things and making it into one really pretty square honestly when you're down there it's it's a huge parking lot is what it is and yet it's cool and it's a really, it's a cool view to, from the city. It's a cool view the other direction, looking at the balcony where the Pope gives his speech. So, um, but it's, 
the the style they're using doric style to 244 doric columns so you know it's amazing how they but again it's lavish it's think about just the time to make one of those marble statues and to think about the fact that there are 140 of them many different artists and many different architects worked on this piazza to get it done but it was designed by Bernin. so just keep that in mind too okay so we don't have a lot left or it seems like we do but we really don't i'm going to go through this kind of fast the other thing that was going on and this is this is in spanish baroque and you can see the the one on the right hand side probably feels that this feels much more baroque on the the left hand side these are the royal palaces and to our minds they look you know like they're, they're they have a little bit of the the domes are actually very much moroccan in in style so they they there are little elements that kind of cater back to the islamic roots but um it's much more austere than much of the rest of the spanish baroque so most of the spanish baroque and most of the italian baroque are going to look much more like the building on the right where you have a lot of arched windows but then you have all these like fiddly things that are all around all of the rooftops kind of like little statues and in many of them are little statues but they're also just finials and little carved out shapes and it's it but it may gives the impression of course of having lots and lots of detail which is the whole point of baroque now in versailles this is only a painted rendering of of the versailles at the time it is still kept up but the the grounds were extensive but it was meant as a, essentially like a, its own community where you could live, you could have the, had a, the, the, one of its biggest buildings were the, was the orangery, which had all of the plants and a lot of stuff that people could grow and then go and plant, you know, kind of like Disney. Disney actually, Disney World has a lot of these things too, where they have these big warehouses of plants. So if something dies, they can immediately replace it with one the same size. Well, he intended this to be a place where he a he could have his own time but he could also spend a lot of time with his courtiers if he wanted and then he did have lavish parties in fact right here would be a lavish party but they would also do have they have a, a staging area up here in this building and so they would stage plays and operas um, that you would watch from the grounds so you'd watch them from outside but they, it was intentionally, it was, it was created and designed to house lots and lots and lots and lots of people all at the same time, and then have a lot of activities going on. Uh, probably the most famous building, famous room in Versailles is the Hall of Mirrors. And it was intentional so that either, whether by day or night, the mirrors on one side, on the left, so you can see them on the left, would mirror, they, they have exactly the same form and shape, and even the little um, metal bars in between um, slats of mirrors as the windows on the other side and so they would hold big balls in here and with crushes with tons of, you know hundreds of people in them and at night all of the chandeliers would of course glisten and they'd sparkle off both the windows and the mirrors but it was meant to create this kind of parallel universe where it both sides looked like they were the same even though one side was mirrors and one, one side was was windows and the paintings up at the top were all gilded with gold and they had all this lavish molding, which was both reminiscent of the inside of the Vatican, but also went beyond it. The, the, the amount of gilt um, addition to all of the wall stuff, the carvings, all of this stuff is just astonishing for this, this time period. Um, if, if you wanted, you know, something super fancy, you would go all Baroque because that's just, that's what they did. Everything was, and these were not painted gold. They were leafed in gold because that's just more expensive. So, you know, the ceilings, I mean, just the, the, the just one chandelier has to be worth in today's market. We're, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, just really, really wasteful. And of course, now who saw these? Servants were the only ones who saw them besides the courtiers and the king. Regular ordinary people weren't allowed to just come through and look, you know, walk through like it was a museum at that time. So the vast majority of the population knew that it was lavish. They'd heard about it being lavish, 
but they didn't ever get to see it themselves or walk through it or use it or have any access to it. Okay, so now let's talk about art. And this is a hybro sculpture really is what we're talking about at the beginning. This is not mannerist. In fact, this is probably going to be much more towards the, you know, the Greek ideal than anything, except it's much more emotional than the Greek statues ever were. So this is actually from a Greek myth, this, this particular statue, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a rape. It's, a, it's actually Persephone or Proserpina. Um, who's being taken off by the god Hades and his I there's some extra photos in the chapter that show the backside even of her and you can see it, it in the marble that um, Bernini has carved has it, it essentially shown the man's the older man's hands pressing into the girl's thigh so it's extremely detailed and her the ang angst on her face and the kind of disgruntlement on his face because she obviously doesn't want to go with him. But the musculature, everything is just very vividly emotional. And that's typically, of course, Baroque, but it's also typically Bernini. The other thing that's happening is that these are both, both figures are kind of off balance. So remember the contraposto that was very common in Greek, Greek um, sculpture where one you know they weren't really standing straight up you know like the the egyptians would they kind of lean to the side and more weight was on one leg than the other well this is placed to the extreme in bo high baroque art so the, the there's an imbalance but it's like both one imbalance balances out the other imbalance but nothing you know kind of like the the last supper thing everything is kind of not there's no symmetry it's all you know different angles all balanced against each other and so that's much more typically baroque art so this is the just the you know the where is she so there's the the rape of proserpina and then we get to another bernini sculpture you can see, there's the, the other picture you can see him his hands kind of pressing into her thighs but it's so realistic her feet are realistic even the three-headed dog Cerberus is is realistic, um, and it's it's meant to capture both the action of her rape, but also or abduction, but I'll, which is what rape meant back then. Of course, it usually invented it, it involved the other stuff too. You know, don't get me wrong, but um, he's she's actually you know messing with his face. And I think her fingernails are touching his forehead. So she's really fighting back. But it's all action. It's action and drama and emotion. And yet it's also very realistic looking. Even the hair on, on Cerberus's neck underneath his three heads is really realistic. It looks like fur. And, and yet it's carved in marble, which is just, it always fascinates me that they can do this. Then we have David, this is my favorite David, and you don't have to be partial, you can totally disagree with me, but this is again the David and Goliath story, but it's a very different David. And you think about, yeah, he sort of has the same haircut a little bit as the David by Michelangelo, and yet he is not standing around. He's not just slightly, you know, with one, hand, one leg holding more of his weight than the other with his hip shifted, no. This dude has, his actual he, he's actually holding his sling he's rearing back he has his bottom lip tucked down into in underneath in between his teeth he is ready to go and he is just about to chuck that rock at goliath and fell him now think about back in the in you know with botticelli's um david he was um you know, one David was just, he, he was actually had one foot on the head of Goliath, you know, and, and then Michelangelo's David, you know, was just th this big studly dude with oversized hands and feet and head who was just standing around looking and posing. This dude is in action. So we've got the, the, the drama of this, this man who's just about to chuck off the, the thing. We certainly see the intensity in his gaze. He's determined, I guess, to face the giant. He's also looking up, so he's obviously facing a much larger adversary. But it's it's meant, of course, and he's in proportion. If the Greeks saw this one, they'd say, okay, well, he's a little too movie, but you know, he's he really works. He proportionately, he's perfect. 
And so, but he's also muscular. You can see the movement of the muscles. I mean, all of that. That's Baroque. Okay. The other thing that's Baroque, and this is probably the epitome of the Baroque art and Baroque sculpture, is the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Remember, we man mentioned St. Teresa before, and she is... She was that that nun, remember, who had all these visions. Well, her visions, the way she described them, would be this, essentially, she would have these dreams of this angel coming and taking a, an arrow and stabbing her in the chest with it. And she said it was the most exquisite pain and pleasure. That's how she describes it. And so this is the an up close of her face. This is Teresa, St. Teresa, in nun's habit, sleeping, and yet she is also, the, the hand that you see over on this side, on the left, there are two hands. Her hand is the one that's kind of upturned with the curled fingers. Then there's a hand that's reaching down. That's the hand of a, an angel who's off the picture, who is holding an arrow so that he can stab her again with it. Okay, and the arrow is made of wood, painted, painted wood. But it's about the only wood thing that's in here. But that's not good enough, of course. Bernini was, remember, an architect as well as a sculptor. And so he, let's let's look at the actual, you know, if you if you look at the sculpture itself, and I'll do that first. Let's go big. And I'm just going to move in so we can see the, the actual sculpture. He created this entire environment around it. This is actually not even the main altar inside of the church where it resides in Rome. This is actually a side altar. And I never would have known it because it's so flamboyant and over the top. And yet it is absolutely just on the side of the church. It, it's actually hard to find if you go to Rome. I did find it, but you, you have to really have to look. But she is leaning back in this contraposto. Again, the, the, the angel's kind of leaning back, although he is smiling as he's about to stab her with an arrow. And then she's leaning back in repose, but you can actually see both of her feet are carved and all of her, her nun's habit are all in layers, just kind of all rumpled all around her. So it's a really, you know, emotional scene, you know, and of course it's the ecstasy of St. Teresa, which is a little suspect. But anyway, behind it, um, Bernini fashioned all these wooden reeds that are coming down from what is actually a, an opening to let in sunlight. And so during the day, which is when you want to see the statue, the sun hit, the sunlight hits these reeds and it looks like the sun's rays are coming down and showering, you know, or, or sanctifying what St. Teresa is dreaming or whatever. But the truth is, is it's hard to pay attention to the statue because of all the rest of the Baroque stuff going on in this picture. So not only do we have, I think, nine different colors of marble from white to pink to yellow to to black to green to blue to red I mean every color in the rainbow of marble and these are real marbles but they're all inlaid around each other the the all of the the, the pillars you can see are all all have Corinthian tops to them do you see the Corinthian the little leaves all sticking out and then above that there's so much crown molding that is so ornate and the only thing that's not made of of um, marble is the, the little guys way up top all the little cupids are made of plaster and yet it is so ornate everything carved out of these it's just minute detail it's like your granny's you know, hand knitted doilies on on drugs. It is so poofy. It's not the way I would ever decorate. It look and, and you know you think about oh it looks like a mausoleum. Well, it kind of does. And yet this is the style of Baroque. This is if anything you know you can't even see the emotionality that's going on with you know the ecstasy of Saint Teresa because you're so overwhelmed by the detail all around it. And that's kind of like um, this statue. He had it actually in a museum, but it, when he was in a great hall, he he had he was surrounded by the same thing: fancy crown molding, all these extra foofy details, and it's like you could hardly pay attention to what he was doing and the statue itself and the intensity because he's surrounded by all this other stuff to look at. It's almost like too much to handle, if that makes sense. But that's Baroque. Other things that were going on painting wise were again drama, drama, drama. That's the word of the day. We have lots and lots of drama going on. Caravaggio is probably one of the more famous paint, later painters in the Baroque 
Baroque period. And you'll notice in both of these paintings, these are both, um, they're not mannerist paintings, they're very realistic. And yet the contrast, the light and dark contrast is dramatic. And the events themselves are dramatic. Again, we have kind of a contraposto in both where think people are off kilter or they're in unusual positions. In the first one, con the conversion of St. Paul, this is the road to Damascus, same thing. I said Ephesus earlier and it's Damascus, but in the road to Damascus, he falls from his horse and he's blind. And then of course he's converted, but it's it, his hands look like real hands now. Only the light source is some, from somewhere in the middle of the night, it looks like, and he's got some candlelight, but it's not, it's so bright. So we have very, very white whites all the way down to extreme black. Confic the crucifixion of St. Peter was the same. Now St. Peter, Peter was one of the 12 apostles under Jesus and he when he was crucified he was crucified upside down and this is one of those dramatic moments of the Catholic Catholics definitely took this this became an inspiration for a lot of paintings but this is one where they're actually in the process of pulling him up he's already been um, affixed to his cross his upside down cross and now he's going to be placed upside down and his feet up in the air his head down at the bottom you know and so he's in that process now he was older when it happened so this kind of fits but so we've got one guy all you see is his bum because he's he's underneath the cross helping with his shoulders to shift it all the way up into that position another guy's pulling it by a rope and then one other guy has his hands around the top of it right around paul right around saint peter's legs and so again, the, all this trauma drama, all this contraposto, you know, everything's kind of at an angle. And yet the drama is what's supposed to come through, you know, this heightened sense of, sense of imagery, of emotion, the, the contrast of black and white all add to the drama. Now we have another, a female artist, and she's, she made a name for herself. Um, her, her father was an artist and actually he had his own art studio where he taught a lot of people. He, women were not typically allowed to be in a studio where when there were figures, nude, nude figures inside. So men could paint nude figures, but women could not. She was allowed inside to of her dad's studio, but um, one of the artists raped her. She was brought, they actually brought him to trial. She was tortured during, you know, essentially to confess that she'd been lying about the rape. Her dad backed her up. She refused to recant and the rapist was convicted. And many of her paintings, she actually paints this more than once. Um, this is Judith and Holofernes. Judith is actually cutting off Holofernes' head. This is a biblical story, um, but she paints this story more than once. <laughs> this act of cutting the guy's head off more than once. Now, it's not just that she's cutting the guy's head off, but he you can see his face and his reaction. And you can see his her maid is holding the, bot, the man down while she does it. But you have, like, you see the blood on her hands. You see blood spurting, literally spurting out of his neck. It is the goriest painting. I mean, one of the goriest paintings I've ever encountered. There's no way I would ever hang a print of this inside my house because it would give me nightmares. And yet this is, again, what's the, the whole point? Emotional impact. That's what Baroque's supposed to be. The heightened light and dark contrast is there. All of the violence of movement is there. And it's meant to give us a sense of horror. That's exactly the whole point is that it's meant to make us respond emotionally to it dramatically. Okay, so the final type of painting that I think is the yeah we we'll, we'll get to the more celestial whatever this is this it's a different painter but it was very common at the time. Um, Andrea Pozzo was only one of many who did this kind of thing, and there's a little bit of this I think in the Sistine Chapel when under Michelangelo's management, but this is you know the original to this and many of the paintings the the ceilings that Andrea Pozzo painted. The originals were just white blanks. Some of them were flat ceilings. Some of them were rounded ceilings. This one, the admittance of Hercules to Olympus is actually a rounded ceiling. Um, but there are some in the, the book. That I think I, I give you a couple more in the chapter, but you can look them up. And each one of these took years. OK, so it's not like they were quick you know, fixes, but they all used 
the the vanishing point they used single point um, perspective to create this sense that the ceiling instead of stopping kept on going all the way up into the heavens and so he, this is just one of many examples of this so what he did is he just started at the you know kind of where all of the fripperies and and the artwork ended at the top of the church you know along the walls and once we got above the windows and all of that fancy stuff then he would paint the plain parts so that it looked like the church had another story and another story and then you know and more archways and more windows and if you kept on looking right in the center of the painting is god up in the clouds looking down and so you can see people figures climbing up the the sides you can ha see them struggling with certain things many of the different figures represented different ideals or sins or um, virtues or things like that and then people are slowly climbing up from the top of this church all the way up the clouds towards god and so the the assumption is and of course the point whole point of all of these is is that you know you go into church and you're making your path to god so you can even see him up in the in the ceiling while you're in there during services but again it's uh, add the emotional impact that idea that sense of awe that sense of of oneness with the universe you know all of this kind of stuff it's so baroque and then we get to diego velasquez who was a spanish painter and he painted for the court of spain for several different Philips, but especially for Philip IV, who ruled the longest in that, that, that at that time period. His most famous painting, and I don't I don't have it here, but his most famous painting is Las Maninas, but it's in the tech, it's in the, the um chapter. And it's a painting actually of his daughter with all of her little um ladies in waiting and one of her older sisters. And then you can even see the paint the mom and dad in the back. So that's Philip IV and his wife. And then you can even see the painter in the back too. He painted himself. But Diego, I mean, he made a, a, a fortune really painting for the royals in Spain. And um, he also painted for the church, again, devoutly, devoutly Catholic. And this is a, one of his paintings of the coronation of the Virgin. That's Mary, the Virgin Mary. And probably the most famous inset you will ever see. I've, I see this all the time. See those little those little cherubs right there? There you go. Those that those are very often made into a little framed sort of thing all by themselves. Um, sometimes they even take the robes of Mary out of the picture so that um, you don't you don't think you don't even get distracted by the blue of her coat. Now, her her robes are very traditional. She's wearing purple, the royal purple, and then the blue, and the blue is distinctly for Jesus and Mary. Um, and yet she's being crowned by the Trinity, Jesus, the Holy Spirit in the center that's signified by the dove and then Jehovah on the right. So, um, although Jesus, you know, that's, that's not the typical representation, you know, presentation of Jesus, perhaps. But she's being, of course, now she's the mom. But remember, with, with a lot of Protestants, they said Mary shouldn't be the center of worship. She's just a woman and she's just a vessel for Jesus. She just gave birth to him. And the Catholics reiterated, no, no, she's very important. And so there's still a lot of churches that, you know, like, the, you know, Notre Dame, that's Our Lady in French. So it's, it's you know, they, they made a cathedral in honor of the Virgin Mary. That's all over. You're going to find a lot of different churches that are churches dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And so this is just, this was again for, a church but it's still using it has definite ties back to the medieval but it's far more realistic the robes themselves are you know depicted with the you know very realistic folds people look human These, this is not a mannerist painting even though it does have foofy clouds and a bit of weird stuff the cherubs are very baby like and they're cute but um it's so it still speaks back to the idea of the medieval you know madonna and child and that kind of stuff but it's it's far more it's far more modern it really does it 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 takes some of the classical medieval ideas but it also moves into the renaissance you know it takes a lot of the renaissance realism and even the the symmetry the fact that they have the father and the son on both sides and the holy spirit is right above her 
there's a, there's definitely a very strong sense of symmetry in this, and that's Renaissance. So, um, in the in the North, though, remember the vast majority were not Catholic. So, was there going to be a lot of artwork inside the church? No, there was not. Um, and in fact, very few painters in the North painted anything religious, and Rubens was the exception. Although he was Protestant until his dad died. And then he converted to Catholicism and painted. This is a triptych by him of Jesus being essentially raised up on the cross. And um, it shows that, but it's like the same drama. You still see a lot of the contrast of dark and light, but it's, it's just painted in the North. Now Rubens loved very muscular or um, squishy people. He loved showing the various you know, muscle musculature on people. So you'll notice the guy lifting Jesus, even Jesus is pretty buff for, you know, he's not scrawny and very thin like El Greco's version. He's, he's a lot more muscular and the guy holding him up is certainly muscular. I mean, you could see almost every muscle in his, 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 his shin is almost, I mean, that calf muscle and every there, there, that's pretty ridiculous. But anyway, Rubens, that's what he's known for. Um, a lot of his, he has, he has several famous paintings with women in them. And if a woman is considered to be Ruben-esque, it means that she's quite fluffy and, or squ I like the word squishy. So um, he, he, I think he had an eye for voluptuous women. He liked women who were not scrawny. Honestly, though, at the time, that was the standard. People didn't want, men were not supposed to be super skinny and neither were women, but especially not women. They were supposed to be very, um, squishy. We've changed all that, but that's okay. Um, Rembrandt is maybe the, he's, he's not really Baroque. Um, he's much more real. He's moving us into the realistic, you know, era, if not even moving beyond to, you know, and giving us some insight into what will eventually become the Impressionists because of the way he paints. But one thing he's best known for, and he, he painted some beautiful paintings, some of them, you know, gigantic, lo all lovely, but he's probably best known for, and I have a book on this too, of for all of his self-portraits. He painted more selfies than anybody else that I know. Um, he would be, if he had Facebook today, he would have a kissy face in, you know, once a week, he'd post some new, some new picture of himself as his, his um, picture and everybody go, oh, so cute or whatever, just like they do in Facebook. Um, in this case though, you know, you can see, obviously I, I gave you one example of him as a very young man. I think he was around 25 when he painted that first painting. And most of, in most of the paintings, he's wearing a hat, not all, but most, but then he paints himself again. I think he was a little over 50 in the middle painting. And then this last painting on the far right, he is, it's the last one he painted before he died. And so he was, he, we don't know how sick he was. I don't know how sick he was, but you can see his skin has changed. Obviously he's much older and he's very realistic about the way that he depicts himself. So in some ways he got kudos for that, but he also painted, and this is important. He painted that's why I say I kind of push him into the next era because he painted a lot for um, scientists. He painted a lot of very, um, he meant to be intentionally very realistic paintings. And this will move into the genre painting that will come out during the Age of Enlightenment, which is in chapter 11. So it's, it's he really does move towards the Age of Reason and then even has some touches that will eventually be picked up by the Impressionists far later, because towards the end of the Romantic era in chapter 12. So, but he was willing to paint subjects too that were not so palatable to a lot of people. Um, he painted several different paintings of scientific experiments. And um, many people found them objectionable because of like this one, you know, this is just a, a, a surgeon who is teaching students. So all the one people on the left-hand side are students. And then the surgeon is the one with his, who's actually opened up some of the tendons in the guy's arm and is showing them to people. But it's, it's a, gra it, you know, first of all, there's a dead body in the painting and that people were pretty, you know, horrified by and the painting the the face is revealed you can see the man the, you know the dead bodies you know you can see his face and that was considered to be rather um 
awful. And then, you know, but the, the truth is, is for a lot of people, you know, you have to be polite and not talk about certain things. And so this, he, he kind of crossed that threshold, I guess. And, and part of it is because that's what he was interested in. He wanted to see all the things that humans were doing, not just the fun things or the, you know, he didn't, and he didn't delve a lot into things, you know, he did paint a lot of historical paintings, but he did not paint, he was not really well known for painting a lot of um, mythical paintings, unlike Rubens, who who actually painted quite a bit of, of art in reference to Greek mythology and, um, or Greek and Roman history. Uh, Rembrandt tended to actually paint more modern subjects and more modern events, although his paintings were, and his paintings were very realistic. Then we get to probably one of my favorites, and that's Jan Vermeer. And he lived in Amsterdam and really, I mean, he, he lived, he had some servants, you know, so he didn't live a life of absolute poverty, but he was far better known after his death. I mean, in, 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 of course, any artist makes more money after they died than they made during their lifetime. But um, his paintings were remarkable for their understatedness. So remember, this is in the north. This is not Catholic, you know, area. So the vast majority of paintings are not going to be religious. They're going to be of ordinary subjects, stuff that happens in everyday lives. And Jan Vermeer, um, he had a good eye for people and color. And um, he painted in oils, but they think he actually played around with his oils a bit. And theories now are that he added some turpentine, which is used to clean the brushes. He, he added a little bit more turpentine to the oils themselves. And that gave them more of a luminous quality. We don't know for sure that that's what it was. That's just the prevailing theory. What he did do, though, is he created a level of realism. You can see here, I mean, it's obvious that he spent a tremendous amount of time detailing the pottery, the bread, the woman's facial expression, the clothing. You can see texture. You can see, you know, the different cloths, you know, what are, what's each one made of, the weave in the basket. All of it is extremely realistic. Even the shading is not overly dramatic you know he doesn't have this where's like this it's not this everything's in the dark but there's some source of light somewhere instead this all has kind of diffused sunlight a lot of it coming from the window and you know but it's not bright and dramatic there are shadows but they're not nearly what they they, they just look real and so his, you know, his contributions will eventually move towards more realism as well in painting. Um, and his, his landscapes are just as lovely. And for some reason, I have two of those. Um, I need to delete that. So finally, um, probably his most famous painting is The Girl with a Pearl Earring. And you'll notice too, that he loves blue and gold and those contrasts. Now those are actually in the, you know, we, we talk about complementary colors in the color wheel and red and green are complementary purple and, and yellow are complementary and then orange and blue well in the spectrum of light orange and yellow are complementary and so he's really using complementary colors even the fact that she's got some green which is the you know you take blue and, and yellow together and swoosh it together and you get green and the the tablecloth itself is green and the bread is yellow i mean he, he picks up these colors everywhere and so, and you will see if, and honestly, if you looked up Vermeer, same thing, you'd see that color, those color um, palettes in almost every single one of his paintings. It's definitely there in The Girl with a Pearl Earring. This is a servant. Um, there's actually a good movie. It's called The Girl with One Pearl Earring. That's what it's, the title of it is. So it's slight differentiation, but it has, um, the girl who was, um, Black Widow in the Marvel comic stuff. She plays Scarlett Johansson plays this servant in the movie, and it's it's interesting. It's a, it's a it's a good movie. Um, but there's and it's kind of like how did we get to that painting, and using it, and how did she end up being painted by Vermeer? Now you'll see that obviously in this this is a studio photo. I mean a studio painting. So the black the black background is a de definite contrast. But then you move over to the view of Delft, um, which is not far from Amsterdam. It's where he lived for a time too, Vermeer did. Uh, but 
this is you know you can pick up the water it looks like a real town it looks very realistic the clouds are realistic the buildings are realistic and yet you still see with a, some touches of red that blue and yellow coming through so the blue and gold is just kind of popping and it just does that but his i mean very much secular topics just like rembrandt this is not he did not paint super religious stuff because this is protestant territory rembrandt's the same and the only reason that we have any religious art of, art from Rubens is because he converted to Catholicism later in his life. So just as in the Northern Renaissance, in the Northern Baroque, religion does not hold sway in art. Two-dimensional and three-dimensional art is no longer religious up in the North, except again, in, you know, when you're publishing illustrations in a book. Now, as far as Baroque music, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, especially the religious, the Counter-Reformation just said, no, you need to go back to Catholic Mass, and it needs to be in Latin. Um, Bach, who was actually a Protestant, um, he was in Germany, but he, he actually composed quite a few Masses for Catholics and for Catholic Mass, and he also composed a lot of music for Protestants and for Protestant churches. So he kind of got the best of both worlds. And if you want quintessential Baroque, you cannot go any better than Bach. Bach was the epitome of what Baroque means. So think about it that way, I guess, more than anything else. And um, in France, probably Lully was the most um, important composer of Baroque music. He composed a lot for ballet. And of course that would include a lot of music for Louis XIV's court in Versailles. And so, but he was one of the, he, he was a, both a choreographer for the ballet and he was a composer for the ballet. And he fell out of favor at one point with Louis XIV and then got back into favor, but he still had a tremendous influence on French music at the time. And that included in Italy and France, opera. Um, opera became, and it's one of the reasons why women will be allowed on stage in Italy earlier than other places. Even though, you know, yes, Italy had an earlier Renaissance, Italy, maybe Italy's just ahead, I don't know. But they allowed women on stage because women who were trained in voice were far better singers than young boys whose voices had not changed yet. And so opera pretty much affected a shift towards allowing women on the theater, uh, on stage. Now, in England and many other places, women would not be allowed on stage with speaking parts until like in, in Charles II's case, his mistress really wanted to be on stage. And so he made it legal for women to become actors and be on stage and have speaking roles so that his mistress could do that. In fact, we even have stories of Charles um, II who, um, where he would dress up as a woman, his mistress would dress up as a guy and they would do cross-dressing plays together. So, you know, people get weird even back then. So if you think, you know that we're all weird now oh just imagine because it was it was pretty weird back then pretty pretty weird don't think that we're the first ones who came up with stuff and then yet another unnecessary slide for some reason um, but if you really want to look up some baroque i can um if you honestly i would look up baroque fugues f-u-g-u-e-s but if you look up bach you're going to hear baroque um, Baroque is, is well known. I have actually used it for years when I grade papers because it, it mirrors the natural rhythmic patterns of your brain waves. And so it's good for concentration. If you're not used to it though, you may actually fall asleep, but that's actually, it probably means you're tired and you need to go to sleep. So don't blame me if you put on Baroque music and you fall asleep. It's actually quite pretty. Um, at this time, early in the Baroque period, they did not have they did have organs, pipe organs, and they did have harpsichords, where, which plucked the strings. And harpsichords can get pretty annoying if you listen to too many songs in a row. But then they invented the piano, and that will make things much, much better. I do like the harpsichord, but it's kind of like, I, I like bagpipes in small doses. Anyway, that's all there is now. I will get to, um, as soon as I can do the lecture on chapter 11, I will post that. and. Hopefully, if you do have run into questions after you've read the chapter and watched this, please put them in your journals as usual. Thanks.